Visceral fat causes inflammation throughout your body, leading to disease. It starts when you're young. It's the first expression of disease in the human body, and it continues throughout a lifetime. I tell people, quit fooling around. Spend your money on things that optimize your health. Sell your freaking car, your Rolex watch, your coach bag, or whatever it is you're spending your money on, that stuff is gonna go away. There's some decision makers who are specifically suppressing these markers from humanity. And guess what they have you doing, fools? They have you following cholesterol. Why? Because nobody gets better when they follow cholesterol. Your life doesn't get better, but your life would get better if you followed this type of fat. Dr. Sean, excited to get you back on the show. Last time we went really deep into visceral fat and because that's going to become such a prominent topic in today's discussion as well, and I want this conversation to stand alone for people that are just tuning in now. Of course, we want them to go back and listen to the previous one, but this will be a standalone as well. Let's give a brief overview of what visceral fat is. Yeah, so maybe the, the place to start is uh, actually taking a look at uh, a screen or an MRI scan of where visceral fat is so you can kind of uh, illustrate it for anybody who's just tuning in. So uh, the uh, position we're, we're looking at in this individual is a slice, single slice through the abdomen of this particular person. And uh, what we what's created is sort of like a pizza slice. So if we were to take an image through, uh, we call it the axial or transverse plane, so it's kind of like a pizza slice through the abdomen. This is the individual's belly button on top of their abdomen. And they're laying down in a, on a scanning table that's gone through an MRI scanner. And so these are their, this is their back. These are the muscles on the back. In fact, they're called the erectate spinal muscles. And that, those ladies and gentlemen, are the muscles. They're involved in keeping your back straight. And when you see an old person, uh, in who's been over hunched over is because those muscles have become diseased over decades and no one told them about it. But if you're fortunate to be listening to the Ultimate Health podcast today, you're going to learn about these particular muscles and the particular disease process that's, that all start with visceral fat. And so in this image, we see all this white here. So on an MRI scan, fat shows up as white. And muscles and organs and bone show up as dark. So in this particular scan, you can see this person is mostly white on the inside. And sadly, for the majority of people who come to see me and work with me as my clients, they in fact have elevated amounts of visceral fat and very often are more visceral fat than anything else inside. And that's probably the same if you're listening today to this podcast for you. And you don't know unless you get scanned. So that's visceral fat, the white stuff inside. And why is it so bad? It's because it secretes inflammatory molecules. So you can think of it as sort of like a, a dirty, soot, burning furnace that's releasing all this caustic smoke that's really not smoke, but it's molecules that go throughout your body and destroy your most important physical asset. It's the slow drip, drip, drip that causes and explains chronic disease. And it begins as early as when you're a toddler. And even at that early age, we can see visceral fat and larger amounts in toddlers that are fed cereal, sugary cereals and grains, pancakes and waffles and syrup for breakfast compared to toddlers that are fed more healthy animal-based uh, meat like eggs and sausage and omelets, you get a lot less of that visceral fat. So no, that's not to go after my, our vegan counterparts out there and whole food plant-based. I'm just simply saying that you don't want to have a lot of carbohydrates, especially the simple carbohydrates, processed carbs, 
that contribute to this. So the take-home lesson is visceral fat causes inflammation throughout your body, leading to disease. It starts when you're young. It's the first expression of disease in the human body, and it continues throughout a lifetime. And to the extent it accumulates, and most importantly, it secretes those inflammatory molecules, you will experience and acquire chronic disease. And for those who are enlightened enough to find out about it today and begin eliminating it, and I'm not talking about a idle muse like, oh, I'm working to eliminate my visceral fat. I'm talking keen plan, satellite imagery, MRIs on that visceral fat. You attack it, you see the enemy, and you eliminate it, and you verify it was destroyed, then your life will correspondingly improve to the extent you eliminate it. I'm sorry for the military analogy. I'm still active to the military. So I like to use uh, military analogies from time to time. That's great. Well, we're going to give people the game plan, but I want to highlight the fact that the great thing in all of this is we're going to give people the game plan they can start implementing today and they don't even need any money to start doing so. We're going to give you what you need to do and it's free other than getting an MRI scan and getting your baseline and checking, which arguably isn't something everybody needs to do. Obviously, that would be the ideal. But it's not like Dr. Sean's coming on and saying, I have the magic bullet for you. I'm going to sell it to you at the end of this conversation. We're going to give you the practical guidance to be able to do this on your own. Yeah, so good. So true. And uh, I like uh, the audience to know that I'm not selling anything. My passion is to bring awareness on this scourge that's afflicting uh, our species, afflicting humanity. It's the single greatest problem is chronic disease because nothing reduces human productivity more, nothing reduces our potential more, nothing impairs the quality of life, nothing affects uh, uh, the employees that work in companies in terms of their ability to work. And nothing impairs uh, or kills more people than chronic disease. And the number one contributor to chronic disease is visceral fat. So I will I will continue to stake my professional reputation on that. Uh, recently, I saw a doctor came out and said visceral fat is not the problem. It's it's the things that lead up to visceral fat. Well, I agree. The things that cause visceral fat are a problem. But if your mindset is that visceral fat is not a problem and you're not declaring it persona non grata, the enemy within inside of you, then you are missing out on the single best opportunity to improve yourself and your quality of life, how long you live and how well you live if you're not eliminating visceral fat. You started to touch on the food piece there. And I, what I like to do is talk about visceral fat in alignment with one of the conversations that happens all the time on the podcast, which is metabolic health. And this is where people are consuming too many carbs, spiking the blood sugar, insulin comes in trying to bring that back down. Over time, doing that chronically, you're going to have insulin resistance, eventually type 2 diabetes. That's just a quick overview. But talk about in parallel to that, as somebody is becoming metabolically unhealthy, what's happening with visceral fat on the inside that we can't see? Yeah, so it's really accumulating. And maybe a quick, I know we we uh, uh, covered this image last time, but I, you know, for the sake of anybody new and for sake of re, uh, recovering this, we'll just quickly go over it again. So yeah, it's best to see what happens to visceral fat when you eliminate one of the most important things to eliminate in terms of a dietary strategy, how we should be eating, you want to be eating clean. And when we eat clean, we don't eat processed foods. So you can simply eat meat and vegetables in whole form, and you will have the same results this individual had here, which is this guy is filled with all this visceral fat inside here at his baseline. So that's week zero. 35 weeks later, let's look at the impact uh, that this guy, that cutting out processed carbohydrates had. 
he eliminated almost all his visceral fat. And if you compare the two images from the beginning, he's got a dad bod up here in this image, uh, initially week zero. And now he's got a body more like a collegiate athlete, somebody in his 20, even though he's 68 years old, this guy put on muscle, grew a six pack, eliminated visceral fat. And he did that, Jesse, without exercising one minute. So the take count point for anybody listening and watching is that you do not want to be consuming processed foods, especially processed carbohydrates, because that will accelerate and will lead to the accumulation of visceral fat, the enemy inside of you. So visceral fat is first and foremost caused by processed foods through the mechanism that you talked about. And I find it more helpful to focus in on visceral fat than insulin, glucose, homocysteine, C-reactive protein, ApoB, or any other biomarker that you might want to follow because they're all downstream of visceral fat. And when you tweak and manipulate visceral fat, those others will either improve or get worse, depending upon what happens with visceral fat. So if you find labs particularly complex, then just focus on visceral fat. That physician that came out and said, it's interesting, uh, you know, you don't have to worry about visceral fat. Uh, he sells services really interpreting laboratory studies. And I'm like, ah, don't have to sell. You don't have to buy interpretational laboratory studies. If you simply follow your visceral fat, all those other ones will get better. And so you don't have to go to doctors. You don't need physician uh, intervention. You just need to get rid of visceral fat. Now, one proviso, if you break your leg, you're in a car wreck, you get shot, you fall out of a tree, then you go to a physician for emergency care and treatment of that. But when it comes to lifestyle and how you should be living, you are in the best position to make decisions about what you should be doing based on eliminating first and foremost visceral fat. So that's what I'd recommend doing. You, you don't have to you don't have to go to an MD, somebody complicated, a lot of training and expertise. I'm just going to tell you for free. That's what you do. If you're enjoying the episode, take a second and let me know by clicking like and subscribe below. Thank you so much. And now back to the episode. Just as a thought experiment, though, trying to tether those two stories together, somebody that's on that road to being diabetic, being insulin resistant, having that happen, say, over the period of 10 years, can we assume what we're seeing here on the screen of the visceral fat, you're showing it disappearing, but we could look at it the other way, too, where it's building up over time. As somebody's becoming more insulin resistant, would the visceral fat in tandem be accumulating? Yeah. Could we look at one and get a good idea what's happening with the other? Exactly. So that's precisely what happens. You see with the uh, progression of poor lifestyle choices, the accumulation of visceral fat, and also the story of health is consistent throughout the body. We see it all over, especially when it comes to visceral fat. So maybe a good example is taking a look at this image. And I don't think it was available. We didn't talk about this one. We talked about it in different form, but I got some new images since the last time we talked. These are only about three weeks old. And so we did have this image, which is the healthiest abdominal scan I have ever seen. This is a single best MRI scan I've ever seen. It's mostly dark because this individual is mostly muscle. And these muscles are enormous and they're clean. Now, uh, in this individual up here, you can see white streaks and white deposits in their muscles. And that's because fatty infiltration is happening. That means inflammatory fat is begun to invade the integrity and space of that muscle and get incorporated. And if you're listening and you're thinking about that concept, fat developing and being laid down like a lattice inside your muscle, you would be able to understand how that might impact and impair the functionality of that muscle. That's in fact what happened. This is a former college football player gone amok through diet, 
They simply just started consuming carbohydrates. They increased processed foods. And now they're mostly entirely white inside. They've got these big, huge love handles inside of them. And that fat is also now, look at that, in their legs. And it looks like uh, Wagyu beef. So I call that human marbling. Compared to this guy who is an Olympic sprinter named Emmanuel Matati, one of the fastest men in the world. And look at his muscles. He has almost no fat whatsoever in his muscles. It's just like beef tenderloin or filet mignon. So the take-home lesson is how much visceral fat you have tells the story how much fat you have in your legs. And so both of these fat depots, these markers of fat, both are inflammatory, both cause disease. Both of them are ignored by conventional healthcare. So what do I mean by that? If you get an abdominal CT, abdominal MRI, or an MRI or CT of your legs, they will not read this highly inflammatory fat. And this fat in particular was interesting. About five months ago was identified to double your risk of mortality, death compared to obese people. So you put, you probably already know that if you're obese, you don't live a long life. You just don't enjoy the life expectancy of an average person. Well, double that mortality, meaning two times the risk of death of an obese person is somebody that has this fat going on in their legs. Don't you think you'd want to know that? Well, unfortunately, the healthcare system doesn't think you need to. They don't tell you about it. Now, before you think, why in the world, you know, aren't those doctors telling you about it? That's pretty, that's awful that they're not. The truth is the doctors don't know about it. My best friend is an orthopedic surgeon. He did not know of the alignment of that, those fatty infiltrates in those legs and its association with visceral fat and decreased quality of life and death and rate of mortality. So it took AI to pick that up. Now, my, my research partner and I for the National Science Foundation started to piece this together because we saw the healthiest uh, individuals like NFL wide receivers and running backs had remarkably low levels of this, and they also, because they had low levels of visceral fat, and it was our older patients who had accumulated for decades visceral fat had the highest amounts of this fatty infiltrate. The technical term for it is myosteatosis. So you can you should jump on Google, get educated about visceral fat, myosteatosis, because you're not going to get educated about them from your doctor, the healthcare system. They, Basically, there are some, I'll just come out and say it, there's some decision makers who are specifically suppressing these markers from humanity. And guess what they have you doing, fools? They have you following cholesterol. Why? Because nobody gets better when they follow cholesterol. Your life doesn't get better, but your life would get better if you followed this type of fat. And so that's what Dr. Sean is out there. I'm trying to get uh, people aware of you should track what really matters. In the research realm, we call it signal. So what really matters, which you pay attention to in research, is the most relevant markers. And the other markers uh, that are basically distraction, they're called noise. So when it comes to uh, signal, Visceral fat and myosteatosis uh, are your highest amounts of signal to follow when it comes to optimizing your health. And cholesterol is filled with noise because it basically is a distraction and nobody really gets better uh, optimizing their cholesterol. Well, while we're on the topic here of the bad fats, let's add a third layer in. So we have the visceral fat, we have the infiltration of the muscle, and the other, the other one of the three is the deep subcutaneous fat or the love handles. Yeah. So let's add that into the mix. Yeah. So let's pull that up and see if we can isolate that's this right here for the sake of uh, the audience. So in this particular screen, you can see this black 
black line that goes along along this edge here, that's actually a membrane, Jesse, that's called scarpa's fascia. Now, collectively, where these love handles are, this fat in the periphery, just temporarily, I'll, I'll reduce it again so you can see uh, the, the fat, the white on the outside is called subcutaneous fat. And subcutaneous fat is divided into two compartments. And the difference between these two compartments is like bricks and clouds, I like to tell people. So what that means is the uh, subcut subcutaneous fat has two component parts. One is this superficial part right here. It's just on the outside, just underneath the skin. And that superficial subcutaneous fat is really good stuff. It actually reduces your mortality, reduces your, your amount of disease. It's associated with protecting the liver against fatty liver disease. It reduces your mortality from cardiovascular disease, meaning heart attacks and strokes. And so how does that happen? You should ask, how could a fat be good? And it's because this type of fat, instead of secreting all this inflammatory stuff, inflammatory molecules like interleukin-6, uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha, and resistant and of, you know, adipokines and, and uh, cytokines, chemokines that come from uh, uh, visceral fat and deep subcutaneous fat, superficial subcutaneous fat secretes sec this wonderful molecule called adiponectin. It's spelled exactly like it sounds, adiponectin. And so you should Google it if you're listening today. You want more of uh, adiponectin. You don't want any of the, the visceral fat and deep subcutaneous fat. So the cool thing about these, um, these love handles are in every individual that I have scanned in the past year, specifically looking at their deep subcutaneous fat, it always corresponds to visceral fat. Always. Now, what does that mean? It means that maybe you don't have to get an MRI, possibly, that you could see how much visceral fat becomes a proxy by looking at your love handles. So if you got love handles super bad, that means you got visceral fat. But here's one proviso to this. The majority of people I'm concerned will look at those visceral fat, uh, I'm sorry, their love handles, and they'll just say, oh, I, I have visceral fat, got rid of it. You know, I work to get rid of it. But the, compared to individuals that get an MRI scan and then they see all of this stuff inside, they're the the former people that just look at their love handles are not going to be as motivated and disturbed as the man or woman that scans and sees that on the inside, they are mostly inflammatory disease causing fat than anything else. So I tell people, quit fooling around, spend your money on things that optimize your health. Sell your freaking car, your Rolex watch, your, your coach bag, or whatever it is that you know you're spending your money on. That stuff is going to go away. Your body and rather those other things are far more important. So get an MRI scan. They're available at $500 to $1,000, sometimes as cheap as $300 if you live in Los Angeles. You can get them pretty cheap. And so the MRI won't let you lie. It tells the truth. It tells you what's going on. And, you know, I'm on the Internet. I get a lot of people saying I have low levels of visceral fat. Well, they think they do. <laughs> you know, many people do. They come to me and they're filled with it. So don't be misled. Uh, the MRI does not lie. Get an MRI. Know for sure. You cannot tell from a bioimpedance scale. Uh, the DEXA scan is not nearly as accurate as an MRI. And even if you get a DEXA scan, it's just going to give you a number. And a number is not going to trouble you as much. If I told this guy his number, you think he's going to change his life? No, no. But, you know, by him seeing this, it changed, 
changes his life. And when I saw that amount of visceral fat, and especially these legs, I couldn't even talk. I was so troubled at the amount of disease that was, you know, had pro- progressed and allowed to accumulate inside those people. So I'm a big proponent of uh, looking at these biomarkers and looking at them and the, the most effective technology uh, to motivate human beings to change their lives and improve their lives. And that, that's what we should be doing. We should always be improving. And let's face it, 99.999% of humanity is not improving. They're getting worse. And if you're listening today and you're not convinced of it, <laughs> buddy, uh, girl, get your photographs out and take a look and see what's happened to your photographs. You want to see that you're actually improving and that you're, you're perform- not only your appearance, but your performance is improving too. Right now, I could do more pull-ups and push-ups than, at the age of 60 than I ever could in my life at any point. I thought I was really, you know, hot stuff. At the age of 16, I could do 16 pull-ups, but now I can jump up on that bar and do 24. So I'm way ahead of the game to where I was when I was a teenager. As you talk about these different types of fat, good and bad, that are releasing different things into the body, and we talk about testing, it gets me thinking about, is there some kind of blood work or test we can do to detect some of these inflammatory markers released by visceral fat? We have the MRI, we know it works good, but I'm just wondering, is there other options there? Yeah, what you can. In fact, I used to spend millions of dollars doing these tests because I was a concierge medical phys- physician. So yeah, you can measure interleukin-6, tumor necrosis factor, resistant, uh, insulin, all these things. But guess what? They go up and down. So maybe you measure it and it's down low and you're like, huh, I'm good. And then a few minutes later and a few hours later or a few days later, it's way up. So uh, it's dynamic. But what is static and, and just slowly gets better or slowly gets worse, depending on how you're living your life, is visceral fat. So I can order any tests I want. I'm a physician. Guess when the last time I got a blood test of myself? Seven years ago. And I'm a health and performance optimizing physician. But I check my MRI scans every, every few weeks. So I'm on that to check my visceral fat. And I follow skin markers on my my skin and other external biomarkers. But yeah, I, I think everybody is uh, spending a lot of money unnecessarily uh, following these these labs that go up and down. When you really just want to follow that visceral fat, because visceral fat and and fatty infiltrate within the muscles always improve or always worsen all those other labs. And to come back to something we were talking about briefly before the whole insulin resistance, diabetes, tethered to this story of visceral fat, which is often not talked about the latter here. Because you've looked at so many scans and we've already talked about this relationship, if somebody has the amount of visceral fat on on the screen there at the top, are they automatically diabetic? Like, do you ever see where things don't line up with visceral fat and diabetes, insulin resistance. Yeah. When you look at the visual versus the other labs. So it's called correspondence. So as you increase your visceral fat, your potential and likelihood for having diabetes uh, is increased as well. But some people, Jesse, will have diabetes with much lower levels of visceral fat sooner. Um, I have yet to see anybody that has diabetes without any visceral fat. So what that means is uh, everybody's amount of disease and their ability to respond to it is going to be different. So one factor that involves and changes that is your microbiome. So to the extent that you acquire a really good, healthy microbiome in your life along the way, you could really uh, benefit in terms of protecting yourself from disease. The other thing is. It's less about the actual visceral fat and more about the influence of visceral fat from those molecules. So your question perfectly illustrates that. So let me explain it. We can open you up or anybody else listening today and dump 
a huge amount of visceral fat into you. Or we could just suddenly have you eat processed foods like crazy, stress you out with a lot of cortisol, keep you up at night so you also are increasing visceral fat, have you drink a lot of alcohol so you're increasing a lot of visceral fat, and then have you go out and do a lot of endurance exercise like jogging so you're increasing more visceral fat. Those five things are going to fill you up very, very quick. And guess what? Maybe, and I, I'm guessing if you give me enough money and I, uh, time and, and uh, resources and, and the individual wants, you know, wants to get that kind of visceral fat disease, I'll have them looking like this in, in uh, maybe three, three to four months and they'll be perfectly healthy. Yeah. Why? Because that three to four month influence is just not enough. This guy, how did he accumulate that? Over about 30 years. Now, he had a lot more disease. So the extent to which you accumulate, if it's slow, allows for more influence of those inflammatory molecules and subsequently more disease. So here's the other take-home point. We see it all the time, my clients. I can make that go away because I'm the world's best. I am the best in the world at this because I concentrated on it for 13 years. You know, I am the visceral fat doctor. So I can get rid of that. Do you think people improve dramatically right away? Oh, well, they do have some improvement. But that slow influence of all that molecule disease, inflammatory molecules, had destroyed their body. So we got to slowly allow the body to heal, get rid of that visceral fat a lot faster. But the disease process that's, that is the consequence of that slow accumulation influence of visceral fat means it's going to take some time to get rid of it. So everybody's impatient. They want the magic pill, get rid of their symptoms. And that's where big pharma comes in. They just get rid of their symptoms, but not the disease. So if you're taking medicine to treat your diabetes or virtually any other condition you have, you're just treating the symptoms but you're not making the disease process go away. If you come and work with a physician like myself who specializes in reversing chronic disease, you'll get rid of what's causing that disease. And then you can allow your body to be freed up of starting to heal itself. So great question. I hope that helps clear things up for your, your listeners today. You mentioned there the fact that if you did all the quote unquote wrong things, you could get a patient loaded with visceral fat within three, four months. Let's talk about the specifics. You, you touched on this, but to get into some timelines for people the other way around. So how long would it take? Would it be the three to four months to get rid of the visceral fat in somebody that's accumulated? And then what kind of timeline are we talking where symptoms are going to disappear? Obviously, that's further out and they need to get rid of it and have a period of time to let their body recalibrate. But give me some timelines. Yeah. So every you know the easy answer is everybody's going to be different. And you probably anticipated that, but what what makes them different from a, uh, a result perspective? Like who gets the better results? Motivation, and then underlying health, particularly the health of their microbiome. So, if you have a good microbiome and you're motivated, you will eliminate visceral fat faster than somebody that has a suboptimal microbiome, a diseased, compromised microbiome, and is not motivated. Motivation is a remarkable thing. And what we have found out, it's you know not by coincidence that I mentioned a microbiome with motivation, is your degree of motivation comes from your microbiome. We have seen and isolated certain microbes that are present in individuals allow them to have more motivation to exercise. And so uh, the absence of them means you're a couch potato. You hate exercising. You're not going to do it. And moreover, there will be a certain microbes that are present that will, you know, uh, is more than just the absence. These microbes literally are fighting you from exercising. So they impair your drive. They make you want to be a couch potato and you, you, you loathe the thought of getting up and peeing in the toilet. I mean, there are people that just pee in bottles rather than have to go to the toilet. Uh, 
That's how bad this can get. So motivation is really important to get rid of health. Remarkably, <laughs> I was with a guy uh, who had a belly that just, they were filled with visceral fat on their MRI scan. Belly was sticking out. And uh, so I'm telling this individual that, you know, they're, they're going to have 47 strategies to get rid of visceral fat. And their response was remarkably, uh, maybe I'll do 30 of those 47. They hadn't even looked at it. I had already dismissed that they were not going to do that. And I'm like, good Lord. And But their belly was, they were so filled with enormous protuberant abdomen. If I showed you their image, I don't have permission to show it. Uh, you you would pray to God right now that you'd never look like that. His belly sticking out like that. And so uh, what is what's going on is the the association with the microbiome. They were so infected with microbes that uh, were reducing their motivation. They're not only reducing it, uh, but were really uh, causing them to be motivated to actually resist that. And when, so I had to ask them, why Why would you only do 30 instead of all 47? There was a slight pause and they go, because I like eating food too much. You see? Their orientation was towards pleasure and the sensation of pleasure and not towards living a better quality of life and uh, really getting more out of life. If you want it, if you really want pleasure, then you don't chase pleasure for 15 minutes. You chase the pleasure that I have for like 99% of my day is pleasure. I just have three momentary episodes, periods of time in my day that absolutely suck. You know, when I'm sprinting, I'm in a sauna, I'm doing a cold shower. So these brief, intense, uh, uh, maximally intense episodes are what improve you. But that's what the enlightened human being pays attention to, that it's these maximally uncomfortable uh hormetic experiences that actually confer ultimately the highest degree of pleasure in terms of quality of life. And so you want to get better. You don't want to seek brief momentary periods of pleasure. And that's the big difference. I want to come back to the microbiome piece and diet. But before we do, I want to talk more about fat. And we've talked about a lot of different kinds of fat, good and bad. The one type of fat that comes up in the health world quite a bit, and I've never heard you mention, is brown fat. How do you feel about that? Yeah, love it. Brown fat is uh, the the uh, term. Brown fat sometimes is called bat, brown adipose tissue. And so it's really not brown. But when you look underneath a microscope, it has the appearance of being darker. So it kind of has a browning kind of appearance to it. It's not completely black. And the specific feature of this type of fat, why it's darker and it has this opacity, is it has increased mitochondria relative uh, in the cells relative to other adipose tissue, fat, fat tissue. And so with the increased adiposity uh, or mitochondria in those adipose sites, uh, those cells are healthier. Those are the powerhouses for uh, increasing and allowing us to have energy through ATP. They produce energy. And it's a remarkable feature that did not start in humans. Mitochondria are actually a feature from bacteria that or whose origin pre, predated, preceded Homo sapiens. So literally, these microbes get into us and they start to incorporate genetic material. We are swapping genetic and DNA material with the microbes that live inside of us and on us. So what that should mean to you, if you already aren't interested in the microbiome, is they are influencing our genetic makeup. And so you want the best microbes in you, and you don't want to have uh, you don't want to have bad ones. And the the good ones help us to live better and acquire better features that ultimately lead to beneficial things like brown fat. And brown fat is beneficial because 
it is associated with improved metabolism. So individuals that uh, are more metabolically healthy, have higher levels of brown adipose tissue or brown fat, and people with more brown fat have better, uh, healthier levels of uh, enjoy uh, healthier metabolism as well. And so a few things you could do to increase your brown fat first and foremostly is we see brown fat increase through hormetic exposure to really cold, uh, extremely cold environments. So things like a cold plunge, going into doing a polar bear plunge into a lake in the, in the wintertime. Uh, we do this up here in Minnesota. And uh, or if I, I don't want to go to, I personally don't like the lakes in Minnesota because they're, they're filled with glyphosate from all the nitwits around the, the lake that are dumping uh, weed killer and Roundup into the yard and it goes into all the lakes and nobody's talking about it. Good God. And then they go and swim in those lakes. So I personally uh, do cold showers and uh, allow that cold water get on me and to the point that I start shivering and uh, that's some good stuff. So uh, it creates a specialized protein molecule called a cold shock protein, cold shock proteins. And the op opposite, well, they're, they're related actually are heat shock proteins when you go into to like a sauna, a dry finished sauna. And so the collected term for these specialized protein molecules are called chaperone protein molecules. So chaperones show up when there's activity to make sure nothing bad happens. And you know what I'm talking about. Everybody knows what chaperones are. Well, these chaperone proteins show up where there's activity in the form of muscle protein synthesis. So as protein tissues are being made, it's the chaperone proteins that keep everything working good and there's lower levels of disease. So cold shock proteins and heat shock proteins, these chaperone proteins, help us to become healthier with lower levels of disease. And that's why we see uh, the eradication of disease in individuals that are involved in hormetic experiences. So brown fat comes from cold exposure. Um, it can also um, come from exposure to certain spices. So um, in spicy foods. So people that, that uh, um, eat uh, maybe spicy foods, they they can increase their level of brown fat. Uh, it's not as much as what you get from cold shock proteins, but it, it is still uh, something that's present. And also fast, fasting will help uh, improve your your brown fat and and you can produce this heat. So one cool anecdotal experience in my myself where I saw this is, uh, you know, sometimes our house gets really cold in Minnesota. Because outdoors, I've seen it minus 29 without a windshield. That's pretty cold. And so our house can get pretty cold. And I remember working out with no shirt on. And I'm doing some uh, parallettes where these parallel bars. And, I, and I'm doing this hold where I'm using a lot of energy and a lot of strength to hold myself up. And I felt heat pour out of my body from the ATP burning up and generating heat. And I felt wind. And that wind was a thermal that left my body and it blew past my face because it was so cold. It raised very quickly. It was wind coming out of my body. I'm like, dang, I've never felt that in my life. So it provided me some reassurance that Sean was building some brown fat and my ability to heat myself up was significantly different than at any point in my life. So brown fat is is good stuff. I, I definitely promote it in my clients. You've talked about the cold showers and saunas now a couple of times. I want to get into some of the nuance here. For somebody that wants to adopt, we'll start with cold showers. You mentioned you do it until you shiver. How long does that take? And are you doing that daily or how often do you do it? Yeah, so... Initially, when I started doing it, it would happen pretty fast. <laughs> uh, now it takes longer. Uh, it's interesting. My ability to go into these cold showers is significant. I never look forward to it. It's not like, you know, you start to like it. No, I don't think I'll ever like it, but um, I, I tolerate it. And uh, so now at about uh, anywhere from 45 to 70 seconds, when I go into that cold shower, 
this strange glow. It's almost like um, my internal thermostat is reset and then my body starts creating this heat. I have this warm glow inside my body, even though this cold as Hades water is coming out of this, this shower tap. Um, I feel this warmth and allows me to tolerate it. So I'll sit in there to about mm, six to eight minutes. And I, I, I characterize it's not like um, like suffering or like super cold. I, I get bored as Hades just standing under this cold water. You know, it's, it's, it's like the, I mean, I think I could look at paint dry and I wouldn't be as bored. It's this combination of the cold water and, and, and uh, not doing anything in, in this warm glow inside. I, yeah. So uh, everybody's going to be a little bit different, but what you want to try to do is mix it up. So uh, I tell people it's hormet, hormesis. So it's a hormetic response. Eventually, you get kind of used to this, and that's not good. And so it's like if you always do the same routine and workout, you get muscle memory, and you stop uh, getting the gains that you formerly had. So same thing with these cold showers. You want to mix it up. Take some time off, you know, and that can change. So maybe go, you know, do this for like a month. You're doing it, uh, I don't know, four to five times uh, a, a week. And then go well, go for a month where you're not doing it um, at all, and then get back into doing it again, or you know maybe take off a week. So you want to kind of uh, have some some what I call pulsation, some pulse to this, and uh, and you're not always doing the exact same thing. So you want to mix it up. I'm fond of saying my clients hear it all the time: nature favors variety. Nature does not like a steady state, the same thing all the time. And so you want to mix it up. And uh, so start out small and gradually increase your capacity for doing uh, exposures to cold water, cold showers, cold plunges, and uh, and then mix it up and change it, increase it, take off some time, get back, make it even, even colder and you get back and just uh, keep pursuing variety. All right, let's move into the sauna. And I noticed you mentioned dry finish sauna. And I know a lot of the people in the health and wellness space, myself included, have the infrared saunas. Yeah. So talk about the difference there and if there's any value to the infrared. Talk about how you feel about the spectrum of different ones. Yeah. So let me put everybody at ease right away. I'm the only one that seems to have a case of the ass over infrared saunas. <laughs> you said. And here, here's where it comes from. Um, infrared is a wonderful source of energy. It's been around uh, for a billion years, come from the sun. And so its exposure and influence benefiting Homo sapiens has been around since our existence, anywhere from several hundred thousand years, you know, uh, you know, on, yes, you know, depending on how long, where you draw when Homo sapiens came in into existence. So uh, we've got a lot of uh, experience and adaptation to infrared. Here's the thing. Nobody else picked up on and nobody else is talking about. The infrared sun sun rays from, it, from the sun, those infrared rays are very short waves. They penetrate just a little bit into our skin. And almost everybody listening today has had an experience where they go out and they're stripped down and they're in the sun, and they can feel this superficial warmth on their skin when you're out in the sun. And if you go behind a tree or something, a shadow, that warmth goes away, and you want to get back in that sun. But it's very superficial. But when you go into a machine made by human beings who are motivated for money and not try to make you as healthy as possible, then those rays are much longer and they penetrate much more deeper. And here's the problem, I think, and I say think, I don't know for sure, is that we have bypassed all our several hundred thousand years of adaptation to this infrared rays that come from the sun. And we have no benefit and protection from those deeper rays. We can protect ourselves from the from the sun, we're acclimated to it, but they were never meant to go into our muscle and our bones, our deepest structures, 
and where we don't have any adaptation from that form of energy. So I personally recommend to all my clients that are working with me, don't get an infrared sun. Well, what happens if you got one? I've thought about that too. Keep it. Just don't use the infrared. Convert it. Go get yourself a dry finished heating element. You don't have to buy a new sauna. You spend all that money buying that big wooden box. Just go get the heating element and heat those rocks up and use the type of heat, the form of energy that has benefited humans for hundreds of thousands of years. Just the heat and not the deeper penetrating infrared sauna rays that come from infrared. So that's my solution, my recommendation, why I'm concerned about infrared saunas. And again, I'll end it uh, where I started that I'm the only one who feels this way. So if that makes you feel more comfortable and you know you want to just keep using your infrared, I guess that's what you're going to do. But if you're, you're listening, you think that's a potential concern, a legitimate concern, why the heck not go get um, a dry finish you know, heating element, put it into your, your infrared sauna and start doing that. That's what I recommend. Spend your money on your house. Not other crap. Makes sense to me. Interesting. How often are you jumping in the sauna? I do a sauna every single day. Now, sometimes I miss it. I'm traveling. That happens. But um, I, I bought a sauna. I, I, I got a membership. And by the way, if you're listening today, uh, uh, LA Fitness, uh, YMCA, uh, many gyms have dry finish saunas. Uh, it's interesting to me that they don't have infrared. And one of the reasons is, my guess is possibly, maybe their general counsel is telling them, don't put the infrared in there because uh, 20 years from now, if everybody starts getting cancer, whew, they're going to come after us and sue us. So hey, anyway, most of the gyms seem to stick with the dry finish and uh, most consumers buying them go into a, a, a showroom and you got some fancy pants uh slick salesman talking them into oh it's not as hot and you know lower temperatures and you're more efficient but the longest studies uh long-term studies the ones with the most power the the most number of participants in the study for the longest period of time uh look, looked at dry finish saunas so um they they recommend um basically 175 degrees the exact the longest your biggest study was 174 degrees for 15 to 20 minutes, and individuals who did it one to two times a week reduced uh, their mortality from heart attacks and strokes about 20%. But individuals who did it four to seven times a week reduced the mortality an astounding 53%. And more uh, from cardiovascular disease and overall mortality, all what we call all cause mortality or the rate of death in all diseases that during deaths during that particular time, all cause mortality was reduced about 20% in those doing it one to two times a week, but 45% if you did four, seven, four to seven times a week. So basically, you cut your risk of mortality, reduce that mortality rate in those uh, individuals in that study. And I think it was 20,000 people over 20 years, if I remember correctly, I mean, I remember correctly. So uh, anyway, it's dose dependent. So the more, the longer you do it, the more frequently you do it, the better the benefit. Doesn't mean that you should be doing it for like eight hours a day. That would be where I'd, I'd call cap on that. And I'd say that's like running, you know, simply running too long. Um, you want it brief and intense. So I recommend, uh, personally, I do it 30 minutes. I, I, I shoot for about 30, uh, maybe as short as 20. Uh, I don't think I've ever done longer than 45. Uh, so I, I'm somewhere around 30 to 40 minutes is typically where I'm at. And I do it every day. And uh, the last bit of uh, disease process improvement that they saw, I'll sh share, is in uh, even best, best of all, was in the area of dementia. They showed that those individuals reduced the rate of dementia, which is something that we have no effective treatment for whatsoever. Dementia was reduced an astounding 65%. And given the scourge that dementia has in our society today, 
and how many people are going to struggle. And if you're listening today, I'm telling you, you're going to struggle with parents that have dementia. Uh, and you'll be up all night coming to talk to ER physicians about you know different things. Um, you can reduce that dementia, that astounding rate, 65%. And if you're listening to this and you're wondering, well, my God, if it's that effective, why in the world isn't this being shared with people? You're exactly right. It's not taught in medical school. You know, physicians should be aware of this and they should be opining and exhorting, extolling every human being that comes into their practice about the virtue of not just saunas, but hormetic uh, exercise, these brief, intense uh, stressors in her life. That which does not kill you makes you stronger. But the problem is we're not trained to do that. We're trained to give medicine. Why? Because let's face it, if you get medicine, you just get more of it as you age, but you don't get better, you get worse. So you it takes hormesis to actually improve a human being, to make you stronger, make you better. And if we got people better, we'd make no money in the system. And right now, if you don't know, the largest part of economy is not oil. It's not the internet. It's not energy. Uh, it's, it's, it's not uh, Amazon, you know, marketing, selling and commerce. It's one thing, chronic disease, healthcare. It's the largest part of our economy. It's a huge pot of money. And if that's the case, there are a lot of influences trying to protect that money. And meanwhile, it's, it's achieved at your expense, literally, at you accumulating more disease and in the majority of people eventually killing you. That's right. So it's a system that literally benefits from your mortality, your pathology, your disease, and ultimately kills you. So turn it around. If you're fortunate to be listening to this great podcast, you're learning about the scheme that has been taking place probably since the 1920s, as long as that. And you can now turn yourself around. And that's why, you know, humanity's got the most amount of disease we've ever seen at any point in our lifetime uh, or any point in our species existence, I should say, is, is right now uh, our, our present lifetime. As we talk about these different hermetic stressors, you know, cold plunge or cold shower, sauna, I know you're also an advocate of sprinting and fasting. It gets me thinking about a total stress burden put on a person. And I'm curious how you feel about that as somebody yourself who has optimized their health, taking on this amount of stress for your benefit. And then somebody who comes to you who is metabolically unhealthy and tries to take on these. Yeah, so the real significant point here is understanding that stress is meant to be brief, short, and it improves us. That which does not kill us makes us stronger. So yeah, you could take that latter point and say, well, let me just go out. If it's not gonna kill me, let me just go out and do ultra marathons uh, every other day. Well, <laughs> uh, that is way too much stress. So the kind of stress that we had throughout most of our existence was an animal trying to kill us, another human being trying to kill us, a, a hurricane or a tornado or something that you know blows through. But the kind of stress we see today are mo more often sources of stress from vocations. You know, uh, our jobs that we hate, and we're we're you get these chronic you know, recurring emails and telephone calls, and we just are always stressed out getting up and making those donuts. And so um, in the past, we would hunt and we would have long periods of uh, basically boredom punctuated by extreme moments of terror, you know, where things would be, you know, either we're trying to kill this animal or another animal's trying to kill us or not a human being was often the case and not other humans were trying to kill us. And so those brief momentary uh, stressors improve us. So you want to be cognizant of and understand the chronic stress that I would include distance running and distance cycling in that. And I think that's 
uh, in part why we are seeing, and you could just Google this, distance running, comma, atrial fibrillation. And we're seeing disease, you know, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, cardiovascular disease, cardiac dysrhythmias, and people that do distance running and distance cycling and too much of that. That's not like I hate bicycle. Get on your bike, sprint, and then get off your bike and then walk. You know, so you you want to sprint. You don't want to do distance running. You want to have very, very heightened levels of stress in a very short period of time instead of protracting over a longer period of time. So hopefully that helps to um, elucidate an awareness and understanding that stress is good when it's really intense, really short, and infrequent. And when you change those parameters and you lower the intensity, because let's face it, if you're doing a marathon, you ain't sprinting. Now, those guys that do those marathons probably are out technically running faster than the majority of people could even sprint today. There are levels of speed on that. But they would be capable of sprinting faster, you know, in a shorter period of time, you know, maximum effort. But interesting on those people that sustain those high speeds, uh, their capacity for doing that sprinting is dramatically reduced. So you use a different type of muscle fiber when you are doing endurance exercise. So there's type one and type two, fast twitch and slow twitch. And I'm just going to make a big case that you want more fast twitch. In the end, that is what life is most, the quality of life is predicated upon because it's your fast twitch muscles that allow you to do this. Get your but out of a chair when you're 95 years old or even 75. And if you concentrated on slow twitch, you might be able to jog for a long period of time, you know, having over those decades, but eventually you're going to lose those fast twitch muscles that allow you to get up and out of that chair and also to make a corrective measure, like when you're standing up and you're about to fall, to move quickly to balance yourself. And so that's why... Uh, the majority of, you know, 85, 90 year olds, you see them driving, they can't react for, you know, uh, for crap. I mean, they suck at the reaction. They just can't do anything fast because they've lost that fast twitch. But if you maintain that explosive energy, fast sprinting, box jumps, you know, squat jumps, you know, jumping up and down, then you preserve that capacity to have fast reaction, and that's what's going to, one, protect you and also improve the quality of life. Because I want to be 150, you know, I don't know if I can make it 150, 130, and uh, I'm strong and I'm lifting up things and I'm reacting and I'm jumping out of the way of a car or a tree branch falling on me. Or, you know, if I you know, get bumped in a supermarket, I can correct my action very quick and, and recover and my balance and not fall over. All right. So we know sprinting good, whether it be on a bike, on your feet, for helping reduce visceral fat. One of the questions that kept on coming up after our first chat was, what if I have an injury to say my knee, my ankle, something that prohibits me from sprinting? What can those people do? Yeah. So that comes up a lot. So very often, let me just address this issue. People feel like their knees are bad and they can't sprint. They can't jog. Yeah. You've worn out your joints. You've re generated so many reactive oxygen species. You've had so much inflammation in your body, and probably a lot of it's coming from your visceral fat. And by the way, when I scan people uh, who are distance runners, uh, what what we would routinely see inside of them was elevated amounts of visceral fat. So you know, this is a marathoner who would do eight to ten marathons a year, elevated visceral fat. And then this is the same individual's heart. So look at all that fat uh, around their heart. I mean, it's a huge amount of uh, fat that starts at this point here and goes out. That's all uh, uh, heart fat, or we call pericardial fat, epicardial fat, all a big chunk of a highly inflammatory fat around their heart. So distance running causes this fat depot of inflammatory fat to accumulate. So um, distance runners oftentimes wear out their joints. Let's face it, 
the majority of them eventually do. It's a rare individual that runs over a lifetime and still running in, in their in their 90s, 80s, and 90s. So uh, to people that are in their 50s, maybe 40s, 50s, and 60s, and you've got knee pain and your doctor said no more running, well, take on his word, no more running. Get back to sprinting. Just start sprinting. Everybody's sprinting when they were a kid. So the distance it, difference is you're only sprinting for seconds. So you just need to basically start out doing three to five second sprints, work your way up to six to 10 second sprints. But on this topic of sprinting, you know, warning, 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 warning. They accelerate very, 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 and then 10 times more very slowly. Why? Because it's in the acceleration that you will strain a muscle. And at your age, depending on how much visceral fat you have, you could have a significant injury. Recently, Kevin Hart tore his abdomen. I presume that, that what he means by that, that he got a hernia and he couldn't walk and was being driven around by a limousine with uh, his wheelchair because he could no longer walk. That was a bad injury. So that's because he raised somebody else, I think it was a former NFL player, and uh, at some barbecue, and uh, he tore his abdomen. So um, you don't need to pretend that you're at the Olympics. Uh, you just need to start very, very slowly accelerating, and you'll have less, um, you'll have less joint impact and, and damage to your your joints if you have a lot of joint disease. But getting back to the the question that you asked, if somebody has, I don't know, another injury, uh, something else, then what you could do is uh, sprint swim. Go into a pool and just basically sprint swim. You know, like you're like you're at the Olympics, so you're going for a gold gold medal for the American freestyle. Just do it for like 10 seconds. You don't have to go swim in laps. In fact, I don't recommend you swim laps. You know, go in and sprint swim. I would, when I was doing that, I would do 10, you know, sprints uh, down the pool and that was it. You know, I didn't go and swim for an hour and a half. I did 10 max effort sprints, uh, sprint swim. And you could also sprint um, in a pool against in water resistance. So your joints aren't going to be going up and down. Usually, whatever limitation you have, you could try jogging, not jogging, but sprinting in water against resistance. So that's another form. And a third one that, that I, oh, a third one that I recommend considering doing is sprint, uh, sprint cycling. So get a stationary big bike like a Carol bike uh, or a tack bike. And you sit on it and you sprint against resistance dialed up. So it's really hard. And you do that for 10, 20, 30 seconds. And uh, that will be um, of considerable benefit to you. If make no mistake about it, it will not be a perfect substitute for sprinting because nothing is a perfect substitute for the, the world's best exercise uh, sprinting. But it will be better than not sprinting at all. So uh, consider sprint sprint cycling and a and another fourth form would be sprint rowing. So you could get on like a, a concept two rower and, and and basically do a really intense a high resistance rowing workout for you know thirty to um, sixty seconds, and that will provide you a considerable benefit compared to jumping on that rower doing it for thirty minutes. For somebody that's taken the proper amount of time and built up, what is the ideal when it comes to sprinting? Somebody like you, how many times a week? How long each sprint? How many sprints? What should we aim for? Yeah, so I get this a lot. And uh, for those who are really interested in sprinting, I'm developing a, a master sprinting course that will go into this and I'll cover all these subjects. But the quick answer is you want a variety. So again, avoid muscle memory. Some days I'll sprint one sprint for maybe 10 seconds, uh, one sprint for maybe three seconds, or one sprint for, you know, 45 seconds. Other days uh, I might do six to 10 sprints. You know, I vary, I mix it up. And one sprint might be for five seconds, another one might be 20 seconds. So I like variety. Why, why do it do that way? Because let's face it, our species did not exist and evolve uh, through an exercise program. We optimize 
because of this thing called life. And sometimes we had to run longer against that, that animal to catch it, or we had to run longer to get away from another human or animal trying to chase us down. If you watch in nature, um, oftentimes they don't last real long and an animal will give up pretty quick. Um, sometimes that cheetah is after that animal for a long time goes out or the rabbit. I've seen them go on for like three minutes or something, but that's, that's about it. I mean, they don't go on forever is the point. And everyone is going to be kind of different. So nature favors variety. Resist the urge to develop your routine circuit where you're, you're going to get got your spark, your sprinting program. That's exactly the same all the time. So mix it up, short sprints, longer sprints. Uh, the shortest I would recommend is about three seconds. The longest, absolute longest I would ever consider sprinting would be one minute. And I'd do that maybe once a year. <laughs> That's how infrequent that one is. Uh, and my sweet spot typically is around 15 seconds. All right. Well, we've talked about microbiome. We've talked about processed food. I want to bring these two together. And I think a good way to do that is to talk about your diet. And last time we talked about the fact that you're actually fasting three or four days a week. So with that aside, when you're eating, take me through a typical day. So typically, um, usually like following uh, a fast where I've broken my fast, uh, I'll get up in the morning and I'm eating leftover woolly mammoth. Okay. I got lots of meat around and I'm throwing it in. And uh, because I have low levels of visceral fat, uh, I'm trying to stave off sarcopenia. So uh, I moved to get my view into place. I have, I've worked out today, uh, but you can see I'm a 60-year-old guy, and I look pretty squared away. And it's because I'm battling constantly a, a, another scourge in America afflicting, really, uh, humanity all across the globe called sarcopenia, loss of muscle mass. So key to that is eating copious amounts of adequate protein. Now, your first chore should be eliminating your visceral fat. And I made the mistake of trying to get some of my older clients uh, that were suffering sar two, two things, of sarcopenia and obesity, visceral fat and sar you know, sarcopenia. So they're losing their muscle uh, and muscle mass while they're accumulating this visceral fat. So I'm like, you got to start eating more protein. And so what happened was they were just getting too much protein in there and they weren't, you know, they were overeating. <laughs> And, uh, and so it was impairing their ability to eliminate visceral fat. So get rid of the visceral fat. Then you want to do something called feasting. Once you get normal weighted, you have an MRI, you don't have visceral fat. Then I get up in the morning and I'm chowing down on meat like our ancestors did 50,000 years ago. A lot of woolly mammoth and we don't want it to rot. So we're going to eat as much as we can throughout the day. So I basically become like those hot dog eating contest people that can eat like 20 pounds of meat. Uh, I'm not up there because I'm just really not a contest for me. But, uh, you know, Sh Sh Sean Amara can eat eight pounds of meat a day, you know, if I purpose to do that. So um, I'll get up and I'll start eating meat. And I always eat meat with ferments. I never eat meat without ferments. So I have the benefit of uh, microbes um, uh, with with wh whatever I'm eating. And I, I can significantly increase the amount of meat that I consume. If I try to eat meat without ferments, my capacity on a daily basis goes down to about three pounds, maybe four pounds a day. But I can double that if I eat with ferments. So fermented foods are not consumed because they're enjoyable. You consume them for the micro, microbial benefit, from the microbes that are um, resident within those fermented foods aid your digestion, improve your digestion, and help you to consume more protein, which is important as you age, because the majority of people in their 60s and 70s are not getting an adequate amount of protein into their absorbing into their bloodstream through the digestive process, uh, because one, they just can't get as much into them, and two, uh, their microbiome and the conditions literally uh, around their epithelial cells that allow for the absorption of protein uh, are suboptimal. So uh, that's where it's really important to be living healthy. So when you're this 80-year-old, um, if you're 20 today and you're listening, 
You want to be an 80-year-old 60 years from now that has never suffered the ravages of the suboptimal microbiome um, and a lot of visceral or any visceral fat for that matter, uh, disrupting your, your healthy tissues. So those beautiful epithelial cells are absorbing all that wonderful nutrition uh, maximally. And you're, you're sustaining muscle mass when you're, you're 60, 70, 80 years old. And by the way, I've never taken testosterone. I've never taken gear. No hormonal replacement. Nothing exogenous ever entered this body you know, of that kind of a nature. No performance enhancing drugs, no steroids, no hormones. It's all me. And let me speak to those that are in the social media community that think that that stuff is good. It's shortcut. You're taking exogenous substances and it's suppressing your body's ability to do the job. You got to do the work. You know, if you get some robot to go do it, the work might get done, but you're missing out on the benefits that you get uh, when you don't rely on those exogenous substances. So, yeah. Maybe they're getting more muscle mass, you know, than, than, than I'm getting. Who cares? I'm going to enjoy a greater benefit of life because there's so much more benefit that comes than just producing testosterone. You know, I, um, I want to derive all that benefit by me doing that work and then some robot. So, yeah, don't I get my clients who come to me, they're on exogenous hormones or, uh, steroids or something, I get them off that crap. And I say, we're going to get, make you guys, uh, make your testicles do that work and get you, get you more healthy, uh, make your body do that work, make your endocrine system, make these glorious, you know, uh, hormones. And, uh, you'll, you'll end up, uh, living a far better life <clears throat> than those individuals taking those exogenous substances. From our previous chat, I know, again, you're a big fan of fasting and you're fasting about half the time. And what's interesting to me as you're talking here, a couple of your focuses are on the microbiome and maintaining muscle mass, which initially for a lot of people is probably sparking, how can you be fasting so much and maintain the microbiome and maintain muscle mass? So talk about that. Yeah. So a lot of people think if you're going to fast that you're going to lose muscle mass because the images come to mind of World War II starvation camps where, you know, uh, prisoners of war were emaciated and they lost their muscle mass. And they did. They had sarcopenia. Uh, however, that's because they had sustained starvation, sustained fasting. Um, they did not get uh, a fasting feasting approach and they weren't doing maximum intensity exercise. It wasn't like you know, the enemy was giving them a nice gym to work out with and, and say, come on, guys, let's go get some. Let's pump some steel. How come we're not seeing you out sprinting, guys? Get out there and start sprinting. So if you are in the middle of a fast and you maintain your exercise, your maximum intensity exercise, and by the way, uh, don't go out and jog. That means sprint, lift weights in a maximum intensive manner. Then you'll create... Uh, through um, the the exercise process, myokines and these other uh, messaging molecules called LACFI. And those those molecules tell your body to make uh, make protein, make muscle. So um, the the answer to people who are concerned that if you fast, you're going to lose muscle. And by the way, I just heard this big, you know, you know, I think it was Gary Brecka. He was talking about, you know, you're going to lose muscle. It's not going to happen. If you exercise maximally during a fast, you're not going to be chewing up your muscle. I think he said it, you know, that uh, you, you're going to, your, your body's going to need protein. If you're not fasting, it's going to take from a muscle. Well, guess what? Your body's got a lot of protein, you know, that it, it besides just muscle. And so uh, you can, you can get rid of, uh, get other sources of protein in your body. We don't even know where all the protein goes you know, to begin with. So um, your body's not going to start cannibalizing that, which is important. Listen, we've been in the game as homo sapiens for almost a million years. And so uh, the body's got the physiology down as, you know, to the individual organism that's lived appropriately. 
you're not going to be destroying yourself. You know, it's just that we as a species have lost that. And so evolutionary over a period of time, if you don't like that term evolution, they call it a period of time throughout humanity's experience, we would have feasted and fasted. We would have caught, you know, animals. And by the way, we didn't, you know, go and hunt uh, a little fish to, the, you know, um, extinction. We hunted woolly mammoths to extinction. So what does that mean? When we caught a woolly mammoth, we had a lot of meat that we had to eat. And so we would have feasted. And then we'd have gotten a long period of time where we would have fasted and not had. So it's feasting and fasting over a period of time that I believe is the ultimate model by which we have optimized. And that's how I have still managed to be putting on muscle uh, at the age of 60 and continue to improve my lifestyle. Because I feast, I fast, uh, and I exercise. Uh, and, and basically, in the first two days, you know, besides eating all that meat and those ferments, um, I'm really not exercising because I got a maximum. I got eight pounds of meat, six, six at least, usually six pounds of meat in my gastrointestinal tract. So my blood is diverted to my GI tract. Does that sound like a good time to be going hitting the gym when my blood is working on? being diverted into a concept, physiological concept that's called gastric steel, basically your stomach, is stealing the blood from the periphery, and the blood is therefore not available to your muscles to perform. So don't exercise. You know, basically our ancestors, when we hunted that woolly mammoth, we were about eating a lot of meat, and probably the only kind of exercise we had, procreating. You know, but we did not go out and hunt again. We did not challenge each other. Young bucks did not go up and challenge other alphas uh, well, in a, in w- when there's a lot of meat. That happened in a fasted state. Um, and so, yeah, you, you, there, were, there was a, a, rec- a recognition that when we, we were fed, that we'd basically sleep, procreate, uh, relax, lie around. And, uh, and, and today we're like, pre-workouts and, you know, going to work out and eating a fed state. And yeah, yeah, if you're not used to, eat, used to working out in a fasted state, you're going to need to eat because you're dependent upon food and intake and carbohydrates and, and stuff to work out. But once I get you acclimated and work with my clients who work with me, I get them getting PBRs, their, their personal best records, in a fasted state. That's where I perform the best, in a fasted state. and Makes sense. Evolutionary nature would have allowed us to function the best when we're basically hungry, so we go out and hunt. And when we have our bellies filled with meat, then we can't get any blood maximally to our muscles. So kind of a middle of the road compromise, what's happened to a lot of people today is that they're not filling their stomach with as much meat as, you know, here I am. Uh, but they got a lot of food in there, and so they got partial blood going to their stomach, partial going to the muscle. And so neither job is being done optimally well. And basically all those bodybuilders eating that way, they're going to fall apart and end up, you know, uh, when, when they hit their 50s, they're not going to be putting on their muscle mass unless they're taking testosterone and gear and all these other things. That they've talked themselves into thinking that that's what they got to do. On a feeding day, when you're consuming up to eight pounds of meat, it sounds like first thing in the morning you get to it and start consuming are you having that in dedicated blocks like meals or are you kind of just eating it throughout the day? Throughout the day. I think that's what we would have done. We would have returned. We probably just hung around that carcass and uh, we just, uh, I don't think we, um, you're going to be hovering over it, constantly eating it. Um, but we, you know, if you follow animals, that's kind of what they do. They're near the carcass, but they're not constantly around it and they may not be chowed down at uh, continuously for every second of every minute and every minute of every hour and every hour of the day. So uh, I come and go and, you know, so I, I, uh, I linger around, uh, but I, I'm not having blocks, this breakfast, lunch, and dinner kind of thing. Um, that, that left uh, Sean and Mary a long time ago. And it's interesting because, again, you emphasize the microbiome so heavily with your protocol and the way you eat. One thing you do that really challenges conventional 
alternative, I'll say, paradigm in the health and wellness space is you're getting a limited amount of fiber. And a lot of the gurus who are big advocates of gut health are saying eat a lot of diverse plants to help populate the gut with diversity. You're yeah, obviously getting fiber through the fermented foods with your meat, but talk about how you think about fiber. Yeah, so I no longer think fiber is beneficial. I certainly don't think it's necessary. Um, and I, moreover, think I thrive <clears throat> on a low fiber diet. So um, one of the things, if you're eating a high fiber diet, I would challenge you to think about this is, um, ask yourself if you have a bowel movement like me. I have a bowel movement, it's about three seconds. And I remember seeing this beautiful sea creature one time go by me and it had a bowel movement. It was like so brief. And I was like, wow, that's extraordinary. It's so different than how human beings. And uh, I uh, I remember most of my adult life having a bowel movement. I'd sit and defecate for like half hour, 20 to maybe 45 minutes on the toilet. Uh, today, it's three to five seconds, maximally efficient. It's a banana that's tapered almost to the point that it looks like an ice pick <laughs> on both ends. It's so extremely tapered. And that comes out of me. It's so smooth. It comes out of me three to five seconds. There's no noise. There's no smell. And uh, it is, is perfect in functionality. And that's the way kids are. If you're an adult and you've got kids and you toilet trained, uh, that's how their stool looked when they're little. And today, you know, with fiber and different things, um, you see the stool is very different. You can you can look at your Bristol stool chart and see where you are. But you want that banana tapered at both ends. And the other thing that's interesting is the functionality of the um, of the gastrointestinal tract, the motility of it will propagate and play a major role in your ability to defecate. So a optimally healthy gastrointestinal tract guided by nitric oxide and uh, parasympathetics will just propagate food down and with defecation really should be better described as instead of a uh, a volitional uh, action where you're engaged in the muscles and drive it to happen that is more of a reflex. I'll be honest with you, it's almost an orgasm for me. I mean, you got to describe it best. It just is a reflex. And I'll also say this. Um, oh my God, it is feels so good. I just don't ever remember feeling this good before when I was an adult. It was kind of like, I, I got a crap. I got to go take a crap. And it was just like something I had to do now. I'm like, yeah, woo, game on. Just go on. Pleasure. You know, it's a really cool thing. And that has increased as I got more healthy. So three to five seconds. And the other interesting thing is uh, I almost never have to use toilet paper. And when I, you know, when I do, there's like almost nothing on the toilet. Because um, what happens to, and it's interesting, I read about these people that keep having to wipe and wipe and I, they're, they basically got such a floppy pubo-rectalis muscle, meaning the anus, that it just is dysfunctional. So the way an anus should work is there's a bowel movement. This is the, the inside of the rectum. This is the outside of the rectum then up right there. And it should open up like an envelope and express stool right there. And then it folds back in like an envelope like this. And there's no stool there. That's how the healthy animals are. So you got residual stool. You got a dysfunctional gastrointestinal tract. And your stool will not look like a banana. It will look like a cow patty or, you know, broken up or have ridges on it and pebbles and all sorts of weird stuff. But you want that banana super smooth, comes out, no smell, no noise, no gas. And that's that's the, the health of a gastrointestinal tract. And that's, it's with all my muscles, you know. So your muscle is super healthy. If you got a dad bod, let me tell you, you're heading to a floppy anus. You're going to have a leaky urine and leaky stool. And the first sign of this that you need to be aware of is passing gas when you're peeing. Kids don't pass gas when they pee. 
adults shouldn't, but we start because our pubic rectalis muscle is deficient. You shouldn't even have gas in there to begin with, but our diets are deficient. So nobody thinks about these things. And if you're listening to this conversation right now, you're like, dang, yeah. Well, let me take you to the sports stadium. And if you're a guy, I don't know what happens to the women's room. You know, uh, I've talked to my wife about this, my daughters. But in the male's bathroom, you don't want to stand behind a guy with a lot of gray hair because they'll stand up there first for a long, for a long time to try to initiate going to pee, to piss, to take a leak, to go to the bathroom, to urinate. Let me get on my med, MD terminology. And, and then it will take a very long time for that urine to come out. And uh, let's be honest, uh, we've all been there and seen these old guys. Somebody uh, there sounds like a plow mule that's coming out of them, this huge amount of gas that's being released. And by the way, they're not in there deciding to do that. Good Lord, no. They can't help it. That muscle is so deficient that it just leaks out. And so eventually there'll be grandma and grandpa getting up out of a out of a, off the couch and they'll spontaneously let one rip because so when they don't let it rip, it just happens. Gas explodes out of them because their muscle is so floppy and deficient and their belly sticks out because their abdominal musculature can't hold it in and they don't have any tone to their muscle. There's no tonicity. There's no you know, perfusion and optimal functionality of the muscles hanging on their skeletal system. So they're bent over, they're gradually getting more or slouchy. And so uh, if you pay attention to these danger signs, you'll aware nature is trying to warn you, but we as a species have lost this and we no longer pay attention to it. So that's why I'd like to talk about it. How you defecate should be brief, short, silent, not smelly. How you urinate, the same thing. If you're coughing and you're leaking urine, um, you're leaking urine at any time, that's a bad sign. Wake up, you know, how you function, how you have sex, how you how you orgasm, all of that is uh is told is uniformly good in the healthy individual and should be getting better. And so, yeah, honestly, best sex of my life, age 60. Nice. Yeah. So to recap, not a concern when it comes to the three, four day fast, when it comes to the microbiome or not getting a decent amount of fiber. No, your microbiome is optimizing during this time in your fasting. And so um, eliminating that fiber. And the other thing I will tell you, it's interesting. I just kind of observed this uh, when I was, and I got to the point that I was almost whole food plant-based. I was eating only one meal of meat a week. And so all my meals were vegetables. And during that time, uh, my my, ba- my uh, bowel movements uh, looked like cow patties. They really did. <laughs> I was t- they looked like cow patties. Uh, it wasn't until I went carnivore that I got that banana shape and, and a lot faster and better. Um, and, and then I lost all, all the, the gas uh, d- during that particular time. But uh, the, the absence of fiber... Um, has actually improved me during that particular time. And then another observation when I was eating a lot of vegetables is I'd see a lot of vegetables in my stool. And I'm sure if you're listening today, you've seen vegetables in your stool. Guess what uh, Sean does never sees anymore in my stool? I never see any more vegetables. And I'm eating them. I mean, kimchi, sauerkraut, fermented carrots. And uh, I see carrots a lot. So why am I not seeing them anymore? Because they're fermented. Carnivores, we are worried about lectins, these anti-nutrients that keep the plants from being digested. And so that's why I see. But if you ferment them, those anti-nutrients are no longer present and you're able to digest them. So if you're listening today and you see vegetables, cut them out. Just start eating vegetables in fermented forms, and you'll you'll have a much safer environment to absorb those those uh, vegetables. So, for your top five tools to reverse visceral fat, eliminate processed foods. We want to get a good sleep. We want to eliminate alcohol. We want to avoid overexercising, and we want to limit our stress. Exactly. Yeah, that's it. Those- we'll end on this because you're such a big fan of fasting. 
for somebody that wants to start doing some of the longer fasts like you or intermittent fasting, how effective is that at reducing visceral fat? Yeah, uh, fantastically effective. And you don't want to, uh, uh, what's really stressful is starving somebody um, that doesn't have visceral fat or doesn't have fats, uh, fat stores uh, to tap into. That's where they're they're hitting their muscle. And we saw those you know, prisoner of war kind of scenarios. But um, if you appropriately leverage fasting in a manner in which we have lived over countless uh, generations, then you'll reduce your cortisol levels and it's beneficial. And it's it's the time when you're optimizing. So what reduces cortisol um, a lot from like job situations is sprinting, maximum intensity exercise, push-ups, pull-ups, brief, short period of time. So you can think about fasting, uh, uh, short, finite, they're not so short, uh, extended fasting, three days, maybe four days is kind of the sweet spot to improve, um, maximize your body's health by through autophagy and also eliminating that cortisol cortisol, and those during that, that particular period of time. So um, yeah, it's a, it, it's a very beneficial practice to get rid of the visceral fat. Uh, it will, your body, uh, when you stop eating unhealthy foods like processed processed foods and processed carbohydrates, your body through lipolysis will start breaking down uh, visceral fat and eliminating a lot faster when you t- when you're starting to to fast. And so uh, you will compromise your elimination of visceral fat if you're not doing any fasting. And there's a lot of you know it's it's sad, but there's a lot of kind of urban legend folklore out there that says women are different. We women are not, our bodies are different and they're not meant to fast. And so we can't. Good grief. I don't buy it. Listen, you didn't get any special pass on starvation and when the hunt didn't work. No, you suffered right there with us. You live with us. You're with us. So, yeah, I react pretty strong to that notion. Get away from the parasol toting imagery of a woman. You know, it's not present in any other parts of, you know, species of uh, in the animal kingdom. You know, the female species, they may not be quite as strong, but they're as badass in terms of their approach to living. And knew that they had to optimize and, and through selection pressure, they made the best choices to to live the best lives. And so, yeah, leverage and take advantage of fasting and improve yourself um, and just work your way out to it. I'm not telling you to start that three day fast first time. Work your way out to it. Get the necessary physiological skills to you know leverage the benefits you get from fasting by slowly incorporating more and more fasting until you're up to three to four days fasting. And I tell my clients, get there in about three to six months uh, that you, you you get yourself up to, women included, to a three-day fast. All right, so now we have your top five tools. We have fasting as an additional one when it comes to eliminating visceral fat. For people that have tuned in to this point, we know you have 47 tools total. Can you quickly give us a couple more just to end on? Mm, okay, so uh, one that I really like um, is uh, sunshine. You know, sunshine, you tend to see uh, uh, obese people pale and white. And you tend to see people that are tan, lean, general. There's something there, okay? Something there, put it together. So melanin has this optimizing, you know, aspect to us, uh, to our lifestyle. So go on and get some sun. And one of the things that happens when you go to the sun is nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is one of my favorite molecules for optimizing human beings. So get out in the sunshine, and uh, uh, I have on my strategies uh, 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 nitric oxide. One of the ways you optimize nitric oxide is go out in the sunshine, and the more the better. So strip down, try to find a private area. You want that sunshine. You'll guys, you'll increase your testosterone. If that sunshine is not so much uh, you, you want to hit your chest, but down here is where you want that sunshine. So you get create more testosterone. So get out there, find a private area. Don't get yourself arrested. Um, 
and uh, create create a safe space at your in your property. Figure it out. You're smart. You got cerebral cortex. You know, figure it out. Nobody else can see you. Get in there. Get that sunshine on. All right. Now we got sunshine. Let's go one more before we part ways. <laughs> okay. So um, one other, I'll give you a turger, a uh, skin turger. So skin turger is how fast your skin snaps. Let's see if I get to that camp. How fast your skin snaps back when you let go is your skin turger. And what will that, that becomes an interesting biomarker. So if you pay attention to biomarkers for the pur- purpose of optimizing your health, you'll you'll see the cause benefit, you know, uh, effect that when you do something, it causes this benefit and skin turgor will improve. If you go out in the sunshine, if you sprint, you go into a sauna, it will all instantly improve your skin turgor. So. The take-home lesson there is track your skin turgor. Um, it has more to do with nitric oxide than it does with collagen. I will admit that when you get older, you have less collagen in your skin, but it's nitric oxide that has the best prevalence and the best um, uh, uh, importance when it comes to improving skin turgor. So track skin turgor, go out in the sunshine, sprint, go into a sauna, and fasting will all improve your your skin turgor so you become more healthy. All right, Dr. Sean, thank you for coming back on the show. I love the conversation. We're going to link up your YouTube channel, your social media, your website, everything in the show notes. And again, thank you. All right, Jesse. Well, as usual, it's great to be back with you and your audience. I look forward uh, to any comments from your audience and, and, uh, and probably future appearances for uh, the Ultimate Health Podcast. Now that you're done with Dr. Sean, you're going to want to head over here and catch my chat with Prof Noakes. He'll teach you all about the low-carb diet. You don't want to miss this. I'll see you over there. So for 33 years, I promoted the carbohydrate diet, and it took me to get sick. And when I got sick and felt fat and lazy and couldn't run properly, I was ready.